Pygmalion by George Bernard Shaw. Act 1. Covent Garden at 11.15 p.m. Torrents of heavy summer rain. Cab whistles blowing frantically in all directions. Pedestrians running for shelter into the market and under the portico of St. Paul's Church, where there are already several people, among them a lady and her daughter in evening dress. They are all peering out gloomily at the rain, except one man with his back turned to the rest, who seems wholly preoccupied with a notebook in which he is writing busily. The church clock strikes the first quarter. The daughter, in the space between the central pillars close to the one on her left. I'm getting chilled to the bone. What can Freddy be doing all this time? He's been gone twenty minutes. The mother, on her daughter's right. Not so long, but he ought to have got us a cab by this. A bystander, on the lady's right. They won't get no cab, not until half past eleven, missus, when they come back after dropping their theatre fares. The mother. But we must have a cab. We can't stand here until half past eleven. It's too bad. Well, it ain't my fault, missus. If Freddy had a bit of gumption, he would have got one at the theatre door. What could he have done, poor boy? Other people got cabs. Why couldn't he? Freddy rushes in out of the rain from the Southampton Street side and comes between them, closing a dripping umbrella. He is a young man of twenty in evening dress, very wet around the ankles. Well, haven't you got a cab? There's not one to be had for love or money. Oh, Freddy, there must be one. You can't have tried. It's too tiresome. Do you expect us to go and get one ourselves? I tell you, they're all engaged. The rain was so sudden, nobody was prepared, and everybody had to take a cab. I've been to Charing Cross one way, and nearly to Ludgate Circus the other, and they were all engaged. Did you try Trafalgar Square? There wasn't one at Trafalgar Square. Did you try? I tried as far as Charing Cross Station. Did you expect me to walk to Hammersmith? You haven't tried at all. You really are helpless, Freddy. Go again, and don't come back until you have found a cab. I shall simply get soaked for nothing. And what about us? Are we to stay here all night in this draft with next to nothing on, you selfish pig? Oh, very well, I'll go, I'll go. He opens his umbrella and dashes off strandwards, but comes into collision with a flower girl who is hurrying in for shelter, knocking her basket out of her hands. A blinding flash of lightning, followed instantly by a rattling peal of thunder, orchestrates the incident. Now then, Freddy, look where you're going, dear. Sorry. He rushes off. The flower girl, picking up her scattered flowers and replacing them in the basket. There's menace for you. Two bunches of violets trawled into the mud. She sits down on the plinth of the column, sorting her flowers on the lady's right. She is not at all an attractive person. She is perhaps eighteen, perhaps twenty, hardly older. She wears a little sailor hat of black straw that has long been exposed to the dust and soot of London and has seldom, if ever, been brushed. Her hair needs washing rather badly. Its mousy color can hardly be natural. She wears a shoddy black coat that reaches nearly to her knees and is shaped to her waist. She has a brown skirt with a coarse apron. Her boots are much the worse for wear. She is no doubt as clean as she can afford to be, but compared to the ladies, she is very dirty. Her features are no worse than theirs, but their condition leaves something to be desired, and she needs the services of a dentist. How do you know that my son's name is Freddy, pray? How is your son, is he? Well, for any duty balls a mother should eat it now better to spawn a spore girl's flowers than run away about paying. Will you pay me for them? Here, with apologies, this desperate attempt to represent her dialect without a phonetic alphabet must be abandoned as unintelligible outside London. Do nothing of the sort, mother. The idea. Please allow me, Clara. Have you any pennies? No, I have nothing smaller than sixpence. Oh, I can give you change for a tanner, kind lady. Mother speaking to Clara. Give it to me. Clara parts reluctantly. And now to the girl. This is for your flowers. Oh, thank you, kindly lady. Make her give you the change. These things are only a penny a bunch. Do hold your tongue, Clara. Speaking to the girl. You can keep the change. Oh, thank you, lady. Now, tell me how you know that young gentleman's name. I didn't. 
I heard you call him by it. Don't try to deceive me. The flower girl protesting. Who's trying to deceive you? I called him Freddy or Charlie, same as you might yourself, you who was talking to a stranger and wished to be pleasant. She sits down beside her basket. Sixpence thrown away. Really, Mama, you might have spared Freddy that. She retreats in disgust behind the pillar. An elderly gentleman of the amiable military type rushes into shelter and closes a dripping umbrella. He is in the same plight as Freddy, very wet about the ankles. He is in evening dress with a light overcoat. He takes the place left vacant by the daughter's retirement. Phew! Oh, sir, is there any sign of it stopping? The gentleman speaks. I am afraid not. It started worse than ever about two minutes ago. He goes to the plinth beside the flower girl, puts up his foot on it, and stoops to turn down his trouser ends. Oh, dear. She retires sadly and joins her daughter. The flower girl, taking advantage of the military gentleman's proximity to establish friendly relations with him. If it's worse in the sign, it's nearly over. So cheer up, Captain, and buy a flower off a poor girl. I'm sorry, I haven't any change. Oh, I can give you change, Captain. For a sovereign, I have nothing less. Gone. Oh, do buy a flower off me, Captain. I can change half a crown. Take this for tuppence. Now, don't be troublesome. There's a good girl. Trying his pockets. I really haven't any change. Oh, stop. Here's three halfpence, if that's any use to you. He retreats to the other pillar. The flower girl is disappointed, but thinking three halfpence better than nothing. Thank you, sir. The bystander next to the girl. You be careful, give him a flower for it. There's a bloke here behind taking down every blessed word you're saying. All turn to the man who is taking notes. The flower girl springs up, terrified. I ain't done nothing wrong by speaking to the gentleman. I have a right to sell flowers if I keep off the curb. I'm a respectable girl, so help me. I never spoke to him except to ask him to buy a flower off me. There is general hubbub, mostly sympathetic to the flower girl, but deprecating her excessive sensibility. Cries of, don't start hollering. Who's hurting you? Nobody's going to touch you. What's the good of fussing and steady, so on and so forth? Easy, easy, etc. Come from the elderly staid spectators who pat her comfortingly. Less patient ones bid her shut her head or ask her roughly what is wrong with her. A remoter group, not knowing what the matter is, crowd in and increase the noise with question and answer. What's the row? What's she do? Where is he? A tech taking her down. What, him? Yes, him over there. Took money off the gentleman and so on and so forth. The flower girl, distraught and mobbed, breaks through them to the gentleman, crying mildly. Oh, sir, don't let him charge me. You don't know what it means to me. They'll take away my character and drive me on the street for speaking to gentlemen. They... At this point, the note-taker comes forward on her right, the rest crowding after him. There, 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 there. Who's hurting you, you silly girl? What do you take me for? It's all right. He's a gentleman. Look at his boots. Explaining to the note-taker, she thought you was a copper's knock, sir. The note-taker, with quick interest, says... What's a copper's knock? The bystander is inept at providing a definition. Oh, it's a, well, uh, it's a copper's knock, as you might say. What else would you call it? A sort of informer. The flower girl is still hysterical. Oh, I take my Bible oath. I never said a word. Oh, shut up, shut up. Do I look like a policeman? The flower girl is far from reassured. Then what did you take down my words for? How do I know whether you took me down right? You just show me what you've wrote about me. The note-taker opens his book and holds it steadily under her nose, though the pressure of the mob trying to read it over his shoulders would upset a weaker man. What's that? That ain't proper writing. I can't read that. I can. He reads, reproducing her pronunciation exactly. Cheer up, Captain, and all your flower, oh, poor girl. The flower girl, much distressed. It's because I called him Captain. I meant no harm. "'Speaking to the gentleman, "'Oh, sir, don't let him lay a charge again me for a word like that. "'You... charge? I, I make no charge.' "'Speaking to the note-taker, "'Really, sir, if you are a detective, "'you need not begin protecting me against molestation by young women until I ask you. "'Anybody could see that the girl meant no harm.' "'The bystanders, generally demonstrating against police espionage. "'Of course they could. What business is it of yours?' You mind your own affairs. He wants promotion, he does. Taking down people's words. Girl never said a word to him. 
what armor she did. Nice thing a girl can't shut from the rain without being insulted, and so on and so forth. She is conducted by the more sympathetic demonstrators back to her plinth, where she resumes her seat and struggles with her emotion. He ain't a tech. He's a bloomin' busybody, that's what he is. I tell you, look at his boots. The note-taker turns on him genially. And how are all your people down at Celsi? Who told you my people come from Celsi? Never you mind, they did. Speaking to the girl, how do you come to be up so far east? You were born in Listen Grove. The flower girl is appalled. Oh, what arm is there in my leaving Listen Grove? It wasn't fit for a pig to live in, and I had to pay four and six a week. Oh, ho, 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 ho. and she cries. Live where you like, but stop that noise. The gentleman speaks to the girl. Come, come, he can't touch you. You have a right to live where you please. A sarcastic bystander, thrusting himself between the note-taker and the gentleman. Park Lane, for instance. I'd like to go into the housing question with you, I would. The flower girl, subsiding into a brooding melancholy over her basket and talking very low-spiritedly to herself. I'm a good girl, I am. The sarcastic bystander does not attend to her. Do you know where I come from? The note-taker replies very promptly. Hoxton. Titterings. Popular interest in the note-taker's performance increases by the crowd. Well, who said I didn't? Blimey, you know everything you do. The flower girl, still nursing her sense of injury, says, Ain't no call to meddle with me, he ain't. Of course he ain't. Don't you stand it from him. Speaking to the note-taker, See here, what call have you to know about people that never offended to meddle with you? Where's your warrant? Several bystanders, encouraged by this seeming point of law, now add their own views. Yes, where's your warrant? Let him say what he likes. I don't want to have no truck with him. You take us for dirt under your feet, don't you? Catch you taking liberties with a gentleman. The sarcastic bystander responds, referring to the gentleman standing nearby. Yeah, tell him where he comes from if you want to go fortune-telling. Hmm. Cheltenham. Harrow, Cambridge, and, uh, Inja. Quite right. There's great laughter and reaction in the note-taker's favor. Exclamations of, he knows all about it, told him proper, hear him tell the toff where he come from, etc. May I ask you, sir, do you do this for your living at a music hall? Oh, I've thought of that. Perhaps I shall some day. By this time the rain has stopped and the persons on the outside of the crowd begin to drop off. But the flower girl is responding, representing the reaction. He's no gentleman he ain't to interfere with a poor girl. The daughter, standing nearby and out of patience, pushing her way rudely to the front and displacing the gentleman, who politely retires to the other side of the pillar. What on earth is Freddy doing? I shall get pneumonia if I stay in this draft any longer. The note-taker, to himself, hastily making a note of her pronunciation of Monia. Earl's Court. The daughter reacts violently. Will you please keep your impertinent remarks to yourself? Did I say that out loud? I didn't mean to. I beg your pardon. Your mother's Epsom, unmistakably. The mother advances between her daughter and the note-taker. How very curious. I was brought up in Lodge Lady Park, near Epsom. The note-taker is uproariously amused. Ho, oh, oh, ho! What a devil of a name! Excuse me, speaking to the daughter. You want a cab, do you? Don't dare speak to me, the mother speaks. Oh, please, please, Clara. Her daughter repudiates her with an angry shrug and retires haughtily. We should be so grateful to you, sir, if you found us a cab. The note-taker produces a whistle. Oh, thank you. And she joins her daughter. The note-taker blows a piercing blast. There! I knowed he was a plain clothes copper. That ain't a police whistle. That's a sportin' whistle. The flower girl, still preoccupied with her wounded feelings. He's no right to take away my character. My character is the same to me as any lady's. I don't know whether you've noticed it, but the rain stopped about two minutes ago. So it has. Why didn't you say so before, and us losing our time listen to your silliness? Oh, I can tell where you come from. You come from Anwell. Go back there. The note-taker says helpfully, Hanwell. The sarcastic bystander, affecting great distinction of speech, 
Thank you, teacher. Ha, ha. So long. He touches his hat with mock respect and strolls off. Frightening people like that. How would he like it himself? It's quite fine now, Clara. We can walk to a motor bus. Come. The mother gathers her skirts above her ankles and hurries off towards the strand. But the cab! Her mother is out of hearing. Oh, how tiresome! And she follows her mother angrily. All the rest have gone except the note-taker, the gentleman, and the flower-girl, who sits arranging her basket and still pitying herself in murmurs. Poor girl! Old enough for her to live without being worried and chivied! The gentleman, returning to his former place on the note-taker's left, "'How do you do it, may I ask?' "'Or uh, simple phonetics, the science of speech. "'That's my profession. "'Also my hobby. "'Happy is the man who can make a living by his hobby. "'You can spot an Irishman or a Yorkshireman by his brogue. "'I can place any man within six miles. "'I can place him within two miles in London, "'sometimes within two streets. "'Ought to be ashamed of himself, unmanly coward. "'But is there a living in that?' "'Oh, yes, quite a fat one. "'This is an age of upstarts. "'Men begin in Kentish Town with eighty pounds a year "'and end in Park Lane with a hundred thousand. "'They want to drop Kentish Town, "'but they give themselves away every time they open their mouths. "'Now, I can teach them. "'Let him mind his own business and leave a poor girl.' "'The note-taker at this point explodes. "'Woman, cease this detestable boo-hooing instantly, "'or else seek the shelter of some other place of worship.' I have a right to be here if I like, same as you. A woman who utters such depressing and disgusting sounds has no right to be anywhere, no right to live. Remember that you are a human being with a soul and the divine gift of articulate speech, that your native language is the language of Shakespeare and Milton and the Bible, and don't sit there crooning like a bilious pigeon. The flower girl is quite overwhelmed, and looking up at him in mingled wonder and depreciation without daring to raise her head goes... Oh. At this point, the note-taker whips out his book. Heavens, what a sound! He writes, then holds out the book and reads, reproducing her vowels exactly. Oh. The flower girl is tickled by the performance and laughs in spite of herself. Gone! You see, this creature with her curbstone English, the English that will keep her in the gutter to the end of her days, well, sir... "'In three months I could pass that girl off "'as a duchess at an ambassador's garden party. "'I could even get her a place "'as a lady's maid or shop assistant "'which requires better English. "'That's the sort of thing I do for commercial millionaires, "'and on the profits of it "'I do genuine scientific work in phonetics "'and a little as a poet on Miltonic lines. "'I am myself a student of Indian dialect,' said. "'Are you? "'Do you know Colonel Pickering, "'the author of Spoken Sanskrit?' "'I am Colonel Pickering.' Who are you? Henry Higgins, author of Higgins' Universal Alphabet. I came from India to meet you. I was going to India to meet you. Where do you live? 27A Winpole Street. Come and see me tomorrow. I am at the Carlton. Come with me now and let's have a jaw over some supper. Right you are. The flower girl, speaking to Pickering as he passes by her. Buy a flower, kind gentleman. I'm short for my lodging. I really haven't any change. Uh, I'm sorry. And he goes away. Higgins, shocked at the girl's mendacity. Liar! You said you could change half a crown. The flower girl rises in desperation. You ought to be stuffed with nails, you ought. She flings the basket at his feet. Take the old bloomin' basket for sixpence. The church clock tower strikes the second quarter. Higgins, hearing in it the voice of God, rebuking him for his pharisaic want of charity the poor girl. A reminder. He raises his hat solemnly, then throws a handful of money into the basket and follows Pickering. The flower girl, picking up a half crown, ow, picking up a couple of florins, ow, picking up several coins, ow, picking up a half a sovereign, ah, so, ho, oh. Freddy at this point appears, springing out of a taxicab. "'Got one at last. Hello?' "'To the girl. "'Where are the two ladies that were here? "'They walked to the bus when the rain stopped "'and left me with a cab on my hands. "'Damnation!' "'The flower girl speaks with grandeur. "'Never you mind, young man. "'I'm going home in a taxi.' "'She sails off to the cab. 
The driver puts his hand behind him and holds the door firmly shut against her. Quite understanding his mistrust, she shows him her handful of money. I presume no object to me, Charlie. The driver grins and opens the door. Angel Court, Drury Lane, round the corner of Micklejohn's oil shop. Let's see how fast you can make her up it. She gets in and pulls the door to with a slam as the taxicab starts. Well, I'm dashed. The end of Act One of Pygmalion by George Bernard Shaw.